Once again, this morning, I have the honor to preside over the special session of the World Conference on Water and Global Health. And here, uh, during this special session, I'm uh, joined by Honorable former Governor of New Jersey, Ms. Christine Whitman. I welcome her here taking the time, trying to share uh, some of her great experience and thoughts with us on the question of water and global health. For your information, our distinguished former uh, Governor of New Jersey, uh, Madam uh, Whitman, is also a former administrator of U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for the Office of the President of the United States of America and also chairing the Water Policy Institute. You're most welcome, uh, Madam Governor. Well, thank you, Ambassador, very much. I appreciate that. And I would like to start by thanking our host, the World Water Organization, for bringing together this kind of a group of, of leaders. This, to me, is a wonderful example of what WWO can do in its ability to mobilize leadership that's working to overcome the water challenges that we face in the world. And these are global challenges. Uh, I think we should make no mistake about it. These are not challenges that are relegated to the developing world. They are global challenges for both developed and developing world. And I venture to say that the people who are here today are drawn together by a, a dream, a dream that we all share, a dream that has access to safe, clean water and sanitation for everyone, so that, among other things, children can grow up to have healthy lives and be productive citizens and be all that they can be. The good thing and the wonderful thing about this conference is its dedication to promoting technological advancement, public-private partnerships, uh, good governance, and other solutions for achieving a worldwide water sustainability. I have often said, and I've been saying it for, for years now, that the number one environmental crisis that we face in the world today is water, quantity, and quality. Climate change may be the issue that attracts the most attention on the world stage, but as a practical, on-the-ground, day-to-day environmental challenge, water is the one that, to me, supersedes everything, even if it is impacted by climate change. I no, don't take away from that for a minute. Capacity building, which is the subject of the next session, is, I believe, a, going to be a critical part toward achieving the goals and the progress that we are seeking in this area. When we woke up this morning, whether it was in our own homes or in our hotel rooms, we turned on the faucets and we got as much water as we wanted. It wasn't a problem. Most people in the developed world never give any thought to water. It's, to them, it's a natural thing. We take water for granted. It's like the air. It's something that nature provides, and we don't have to worry any further than that. And the reality is the people here at this conference know water is neither infinite uh, nor is it inexhaustible. In fact, our water services are in trouble. Population increases, food pressure for increased capacity and development of, of food production, rapid urbanization and aging infrastructure, all are putting enormous pressure and strain on the world's water supplies and the systems that deliver it. In 2005, 2.8 billion people lived in areas under severe water stress. By 2030, that number is expected to reach 3.9 billion, or 47% of the world's population, and that's according to the OECD's environmental outlook. Uh, by 20, that will happen by, by 2030, and that's without even beginning to factor in the impact that climate change may have on water and its scarcity. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the challenges are not uh, relegated to the world's poorest countries. In the developed world, significant investment is needed to maintain aging water structures and to meet the higher quality and health standards that we are constantly evolving. It's an investment beyond the capabilities of most governments and water utilities. In the developing world, 
extending the benefits of safe drinking water and basic sanitation represents one of the great humanitarian missions of our times with millions of people lacking access to these basic necessities. As the UN Water noted just last month, more people die each year from water-related diseases than from all other forms of violence, including war. In a world today where we see war almost everywhere we look, the challenges faced by the developed and the developing worlds may be different, but more and more the conclusions that they're reaching on how to address these issues in both worlds are the same, and that is that the problem is too big for the public sector alone to solve. It can't be done. And the answer isn't just more money, although that, of course, is desperately needed wherever you look. It also requires better government, governance, improved financial planning, more efficient use of resources, broader outreach to stakeholders and others who have a share in the system, and more organizational capacity building. They're all required if we're going to be able to solve the problems and the challenges that face us. Public-private partnerships, private business, and local governments working together can sometimes be a catalyst for new investment and some of the other reforms that are, are required. I realize that the idea of bringing private enterprise into the at to the table on water services makes many people very uneasy. After all, water isn't like most goods and services produced or provided by the private sector. First of all, it's absolutely essential to life, and secondly, it's something provided by nature. So people don't think that there's a role for the private sector. In his recent book, Michael Rouse, the former president of the International Water Association, describes a moment at uh, the Kyoto Water Forum in 2003 when protesters disrupted a panel where you had uh, the private sector discussing their role in providing water. And essentially what these protesters said is, water is essential, it's natural, and it should be provided for free. And Rouse recounts how the water mis minister from Swaziland answered them by saying basically, yeah, um, water's free if you want to take your bucket and go up the mountain to the source. But if you want me to provide it to you, to, for, if you want me to provide for collection and delivery and cleaning that water and having it come to your home, then you're going to have to pay. It's going to cost something to do that, to reach that outcome. So while we can all agree that water is a special product, we also need to recognize that a sustainable model of cost recovery is absolutely essential even in the poorest parts of the world. We can't solve the problem without that. Without it, humanitarian progress in developing nations will frankly be impossible, while our aging systems in the developed world will continue to just fall apart as they are today. The Johannesburg Declaration on Sustainable Adel Development adopted in 2002 at the World Summit recognized the limits on the public sector's capacity and endorsed the formation of public-private partnerships between private business and local governments to address the world's economic and environmental challenges. Public-private partnerships are clearly a vital way to encourage humanitarian progress in the developing world and to helping the developed world meet its needs and the challenges that it sees. No matter what you may feel about it, there's just no escaping the fact that the job of building and maintaining water services, delivering them where they're needed, is too large and too complex for government to handle it alone. There isn't a government in the world that can do that. I want to make it very clear, though, that I don't speak as an advocate for public ownership at one end, private ownership at the other, or any particular hybrid in between. What's important to me is simply that we get the job done for the largest number of people. And the way that happens is going to vary. It's going to be different 
in different parts of the world, depending on the, the various needs. Systems by themselves are neither good nor bad. It's much more important that you have things such as good governance, good environmental and economic policy, good planning, and what addresses the needs of that particular community. Let's talk about the challenges here in the United States. Let's we think that, that we don't have any. Uh, water pipes in most of our cities and our large cities are over 100 years old, and they're rapidly deteriorating. Here in New York City, the water system was put in when Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. Uh, water mains are busting, pumps, collection equipment, and uh, treatment plants are failing. The American Society of Civil Engineers in its annual report card for American drinking water structures gave our infrastructures a D minus. In 2002, while I was administer, administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, we did a, an analysis and identified a projected funding gap uh, between current spending and infrastructure needs of uh, between 37 and 117 billion dollars over the next 20 years. Uh, at the same time, the National Resources Defense Council did a study and they cited the water infrastructure network that said that there was $500 billion in upgrades needed and repairs in the United States just to ensure the current safety of our drinking water and not reflecting the changes that we're constantly making to upgrading the environmental standards on drinking water and what's safe and acceptable. So while no one may know the exact cost of what's needed, we know the cost is staggering. Public-private partnerships offer a potential way to attract the new investment that's needed and the more efficient uses of the resources that we now have. The increasing, and, and this is something that sometimes we overlook, but they're, they're increasing technological and environmental complexity in water services. And often that is beyond the capability of local governments to handle. They simply don't have the resources for that. Most public water systems in the United States serve fewer than 10,000 people. Many of these small utilities simply lack the management skills or the technological uh, competence needed to keep up with today's regulations, just as they often lack the financial strength to keep up with their aging infrastructure and what they need to do to keep their systems operating. Many of these utilities are looking forward to partnerships and consolidating and exploring partnerships with private companies in order to better serve their communities. Larger U.S. water systems are looking to private to private partners as well. Between 1997 and the year 2000, some 600 cities had privatized, had worked on private contracts in order to meet the water needs that they saw coming at them. The challenges in the developing world are much more daunting. While some progress has been made toward the Millennium Challenge goals, the development goals, that, that aim to have, the, to have the number of people who do not have access today to safe drinking water and basic sanitation by 2015 are still out of reach. The world is not on track to meeting those goals today. Substantial additional revenue is going to be needed. And in fact, the uh, recent World Health Organization report estimated that $18 billion a year will need to be spent going forward to extend existing infrastructure to achieve those Millennium Development Goals. But we also need effective water policies and improved guidance and strategies for building consensus to overcome political opposition, vested interests, and they do exist, and other obstacles to reform. As the WWO reminds us, the cost of failing to, meet, to, failing to meet the Millennium Goals is enormous. Disease spread by unsafe water cause an estimated 3 million deaths a year. Inadequate access to safe water and sanitation locks in a cycle of disease, poverty, and death for hundreds of millions of people, causing destabilization to governments and opportunities for exploitation. 
issues that should be of concern to each and every one of us, no matter where we live. Public-private partnerships have taken many different forms around the world in striking the right balance between the extremes of total public ownership and complete privatization. The first type of public-private partnership is the management contract. This is an approach where all the assets remain in the public domain while the private partner takes on some aspects of operational responsibility for a limited period of time, usually two to five years. Then there's the lease agreement approach. Under lease agreements, the public utility gives a private entity response for operating, managing, and maintaining the systems. And the duration of a lease for that is a contract sometimes as long as 20 years. On the privatization end of the spectrum, we have concession and divestitures. Uh, concessions transfer operation, management, and most risk and financing responsibility to the private sector. For the private sector to recoup its initial investment under this scenario, your contracts are between 25 and 50 years. A divestiture approach, on the other hand, transfers actual ownership of the assets uh, to the private sector for the duration of the contract. Which is the right model? It depends. It depends on the circumstances. An area that wants to improve uh, efficiency might go for a leasing arrangement. Uh, one that, might, that wants to attract investment may favor a concession arrangement. The ultimate course is going to depend on the facts on the ground and the area to which it is being applied. What's more important is that governments establish a clear framework for making the best use of the private sector's participation with the appropriate kind of oversight that will be required. We have to have effective oversight, monitoring, and, and regulation. There are two, there's two experiences that I just wanted to share with you quickly on how this can work or not, as the case is, one in um, Atlanta and one in Indianapolis. They highlight how public-private partnerships, some of the challenges, and it's interesting because they both involve the same water company, United Water, which is a subsidiary of the French company Suez Environmental. The partnership didn't work out very well in Atlanta, and much of that was felt to be uh, because of a rush to the bidding process, a failure to carefully negotiate and to look at all the issues and draft the contract terms appropriately, insufficient planning and a, and a lack of political will. In 1998, United, Way, United Water Atlanta partnered with the city of Atlanta to manage the city's water system for 20 years, according to the contract, for an annual fee of $21.4 million. The city projected a total of $400 million in savings. Within four years, they were back. They had canceled the contract. Uh, they terminated it. They were enumerated a multiple of complaints on water quality, maintenance, billing, record keeping, and more. And when they did a review to see what had gone wrong, it turned out they felt it was largely attributed to United Waters cutting back on staff and on training in order to come in with the lowest bid. There are clearly pitfalls about which you have to be very careful. But a more successful example can be found in Indianapolis, Indiana. In 1993, the city of Indianapolis forecasted a 33 percent sewer rate hike uh, to allow for the necessary improvements to its aging water structure. A year later, they contracted with the White, White River Environmental Partnership, which included United Water Indianapolis to operate its wastewater system. The projected rate hike proved unnecessary, and the cost of operations dropped 40 percent under the new management. In accordance with its contract, and this to me is, is something that we all should be looking at as we look at these issues, White River donated 5% of the profits to charitable and cultural organizations held bi-monthly roundtables meetings with environmental and neighborhood groups, participated in community programs, and purchased over 12% of supplies from minority-owned firms, from local and minority-owned firms. The partnership was awarded the United States Conference of Mayors 2006 Award in Excellence and has received many others awards because of the success and the commitment to the local community by the utility. 
whether you're in Indianapolis or sub-Sahara Africa, effective planning from the start is a key to success as you go down the road. And fundamental to that process, that planning effort, is the notion of cost recovery. Cost recovery has got to be recognized. You've got to identify the right mix that will allow for sustainability of the project. In the water sector, we often refer to the three T's, uh, tariff, taxes, and transfers, including official development assistance grants. These are some of the sources of, of revenues, and they need to be at a level where the recovery of costs can take place. Prices must be affordable and equitable, but they also must reflect the cost, the true cost of water and of delivering water. Demonstrating a workable model for cost recovery is essential to attracting other investments, including ODA loans, bonds, and private investors. And it's possible even in the poorest parts of the world. In the developing world today, people deprived of water services are forced to buy highly priced water from informal water vendors. They aren't regulated, there's not much oversight, and they pay 20, as up, up to 25% more for a liter of water than those who have tap water services delivered to them. What the poor usually lack is the means to pay for a hookup, for the hookup fees and for the monthly charges of the water. What's needed is a way to list, lessen the impact of such charges and to lower, to provide for lower income households while still allowing for the cost of recovery. One way to do that is to designate a portion of the money saved by entering into a public-private partnership to go to helping programs for low income and providing low income assistance is just one approach. A well-regulated public-private partnership can also help put some distance between a municipality and its ratepayers for doing unpopular things that need to be done, like raising rates. No elected official ever wants to raise water rates. It's a loser, even when the rates are low and the system is chronically underfunded. A partnership or some other government structure, such as a board, helps put some distance between the elected official and these difficult decisions that have to be made and make them a little easier to get done. The United States, by the way, is hardly a model to look to to see how to do this right. We do not pay anything near what we should for the cost of water. A dollar in the U.S. today buys some 375 gallons of water. A, uh, compared to, it would buy 88 in Germany, uh, 111 gallons in the United Kingdom, and 132 gallons in France. So we're not close to reflecting the true cost. A 2002 survey by the U.S. General Accounting Office found that about a third of the drinking water utilities in the United States were not generating enough resources to cover their full cost of service. Perhaps a more t telling study came from EPA when I was there, which calculated that American households spend more on carbonated soft drinks, some $700 a year, than they do on wastewater and water charges, which average about $475 a year per household. Americans also need to get the message that a highly subsidized water or wastewater system is not a sustainable one in the long run. The paradox of successful public-private partnerships is that the comparative advantage of private providers is the greatest where governments are the weakest. At the same time, the risks entailed with private providers are also the greatest where the governments are the weakest. As they are, there's little oversight and management of the public need and what is essential for the public good. The key to getting around this paradox is capacity building. All stakeholders should focus on building the capacity of civil society to engage meaningfully in the dialogue that must take place. They have to be able to influence the privatization and both the public and, pri and be able to hold the public and private actors accountable for what's going on. As stated in the Dialogue on Effective Water Governance, the water crisis is mainly a crisis of governance, or largely a crisis of governance. Communities can and should play a significant role in the contracting phase, and incentives should be provided for mobilization and effective monitoring of, 
programs at the local level. Success for a partnership requires private enterprise development, capacity building at the local government level, and community development and organizations to develop monitoring and supervisory capacity. They are all essential to going forward. Private sector participation also doesn't relieve governments of its basic responsibility to provide safe drinking waters. Governments should not rush to enter into a private partnership so that they concede the ownership of water and management of water just for the sake of relieving themselves of some dollars. Water is a fundamental element of life and provision of water still remains a public, part of the public trust even though there is a role for the private actors to play. There are a number of good resources, obviously, that uh, people at this conference can go to, and I'm sure they, they know all about them. Uh, one of them, I chair something called the Water Policy Institute. We're going to be coming out with a paper very shortly on um, public-private partnerships. Uh, there's a checklist for public action at OECD, all of which are important. There's an expression that's sometimes used by those of, who have been in the public sector or serving the public sector that says no margin, no mission. While public-private partnerships are not an ideal solution for every situation, they can provide a viable solution for an effective framework for addressing the lack of public investment as well as some of the operating inefficiencies we see in the public sector. In some cases, these partnerships can provide the margins that allow us to be successful and meet the basic humanitarian needs that we have and will get us to the point where we can ensure that every child can grow up living a healthy life and reach their full potential and that all those who participate in civil society are able to participate fully and not have to worry about accessing clean, safe, and healthy water. This conference is one of those that can help raise the level of understanding of the importance of this issue and the fact that it transcends all geopolitical boundaries and is, in fact, a world crisis. Thank you very much. I thank uh her Honorable uh, Governor uh, Christine Todd uh, Withman, the former Governor of New Jersey, the former Administrator of United States Environmental Protection Agency for the Office of the President of the United States, the head of the Withman Strategy Group and chairperson of the Water Policy Institute, for her very interesting, rich, substantive, special address that she delivered at this special session of the International Conference on the part of the World Water Organization on the subject of the water and global health. Now, if uh, Madam Governor uh, is allowing me uh, she could take some of your questions for this very substantive and interesting conversation. Uh, those of you may have any questions, if Madam Governor sure. agrees. Uh, you're most welcome. Just raise your hand, and we will make sure that whoever is interested, given a chance. Madam, please. I'm Pavani Ram. I'm a, a physician, an epidemiologist, and I teach at the University at Buffalo in New York. I, um, I appreciated your thought-provoking talk. I really uh, uh, thought that you covered so much. And I have a lot to say, but I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I, too, am really hopeful about the role of the private sector in um, bringing solutions to the world's water crises. And I think that there are several crises. Um, my concern is that the, um, the large-scale water companies tend to work in large-scale infrastructure that is incredibly expensive at the outset. And despite the cost, that infrastructure often doesn't reach the poorest of the poor who live in peri-urban and urban slums, and certainly not the rural poor. And as you said, even here in the U.S., most water systems serve under 10,000 people. 
And I fail to believe that there will come a time when we will cover every rural poor community with an infrastructural um, uh, approach. So I do think that we should encourage our private sector partners to look at point of use household water treatment options as well as community level options. And in my experience, there's been very little interest from the private sector primarily relegated to their corporate social responsibility arms um, without the, the ingenuity that typically goes into their product development for you know, the large scale marketing. And I think that they, they could have a real impact in this arena. Um, similar to what the private sector has done, for example, uh, with promotion and marketing of soap for hand washing. So that's just a comment that I wanted to make, and I wondered if you could reflect back on that. I don't think there's any question, but certainly in this country, we're not going to see every rural community served by a public water system. It's, it's not going to happen. If you look at the costs that we just talked about, they're so enormous in maintaining the system that we have today, extending it to that degree is going to become very problematic. But at the source, water purification and uh, water treatment is becoming much more viable and there is a lot more research going into it. Interestingly enough, and as you point out, the big water companies are looking at the larger systems. That's where you get their, they get to, to make the most impact and you get the economies of scale and they make money. No two ways about it. But also you have a lot of the, pro, of the NGOs now starting to get very involved in this and you have some very creative work being done uh, that you see for instance, uh, what we were talking earlier, John Whitehead is someone who got together a group of, of uh, former CEOs all over the age of 80 in this city who wanted to make a difference and they each put up, I believe it was, they each put up $50,000 uh, of their own money to get started to focus on water projects, on bringing water to communities in, that lacked clean drinking water in the third world. There's a lot of that, I mean, in the developing countries. There's a lot of that occurring now today. But we need government incentive policies that will encourage more research and development. There has to be, on the regulatory side, a framework that will allow for recovering of costs if you ask the big water utilities to provide point source water treatment. And there are some exciting models out there. There's some things happening that could make a difference and could be transported to developing world countries that have less of the economics, the economic ability to invest in these kinds of structures. Any, yes. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Marcia Brewster. I used to be the senior officer for water in the Sustainable Development Division here at the UN. Um, I wanted to talk about progressive block rates, tariff structures, because um, in developing countries, uh, in a lot of places, they'll have a very, very low rate for basic minimum needs. Uh, so for the first 10 cubic meters per month used by a family, let's say. And then the rates increase significantly the more you use. So the more you use, the more it costs per unit. Now, I, have, I, I live in Westchester County, and I have United Water serving me. And the more I use, the less I pay per unit. And I think that's probably true in many parts of the U.S., especially on the East Coast. So I was wondering, in your policy uh, institute, are you trying to encourage more conservation pricing rather than the old, you know, the more you use, the less you pay? Yes, most definitely. Conservation, conservation it's interesting, with both water and with energy now. It seems counterintuitive that the providers would be encouraging it, but they're starting to encourage it. You're starting to see that change in a mindset, understanding that they're, particularly in the area of water, this is a finite resource. It is a finite resource. We're not making more water. And that's something that's hard for particularly Americans to get their heads around, but a lot of the utilities are beginning to understand this, and they're going to have some severe problems going down the road. They're still going to sell water, and they're still going to be able to make money if we have people conserve. But there is a much greater interest now in finding ways to encourage conservation. Energy Star appliances, you know, getting people to understand, buy a front-loading uh, clothes washer, and you save an enormous amount of water. 
44 gallons in the average cycle for a top loader for a regular washing machine, 14 gallons in an Energy Star front loader. Uh, that's a huge difference. And it's, as we know, particularly in this country, people respond to economic indicators. And if they pay more for their usage of water, it's surprising how quickly they will start to look for ways to reduce their water usage. And that is really one of the things that, that I have an interest in, and a more progressive look at, at how we do the rate structuring, and that you don't get encouraged to use more water. You, in fact, get encouraged to use less. And as I say, the utilities are not now pushing back on that the way they might have in the past. Please, at the very yes, end, please go ahead. Please kindly introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Kathy Shandling. I'm the executive director of something called the International Private Water Association, which is about public-private partnerships. Um, I want to turn more because you brought up um, issues in terms of the U.S. Um, the latest numbers coming out of the EPA that haven't quite been sanctioned by the, um, the other um, divisions of the government yet is on the need study um, over the next 20-year period, we're hitting almost a trillion dollars of investment needs in water and wastewater. Um, I think on the wastewater side, they're still waiting for the numbers to be sanctioned by Office of OMB. Um, but it's just getting incredible how the, the needs is just building and building from your days when you headed EPA. Um, and yet in this country, the um, water systems here, as you pointed out, we have some of the cheapest water in the world. We are by far some of the biggest users of water in the world on a per capita basis. But the other thing that seems to be coming out over the recent years, and certainly recently, is this very strong nexus between energy and water. And only because you brought up um, Indianapolis, um, there's some issues that have uh, occurred recently. One is the PACE bond program that has now been put into place in 16 states, which is primar primarily to support um, energy efficiency retrofitting, but in California and some of the other states, it will also support, support um, water efficiency retrofitting. And up in Stanford, Connecticut, they're now looking through um, a grant from the Department of Energy on um, taking essentially dried, petrified um, waste, wastewater and turning it back into energy and selling the excess energy into the grid, all doing this on a zero footprint. But what's happened now in Indianapolis as of two weeks ago, they've taken the Indianapolis water system, both water and wastewater, and put it in trust under something called the Citizens Energy Trust Fund. And what I wanted to know is, I think this is still in the process of all getting passed in, and that means um, U.S. Filter and as well as Veolia will be reporting to Citizens Energy, not to the city of Indianapolis. Do you see something like that happening more and more in this country where because of the tremendous financial needs going on in this country at the cities, they start pulling their water systems into a trust that then segues perhaps into more public-private partnership? I think Dr. O is the one who should really be talking about this or this uh, interest in the in putting together a new institution that talks about energy and water in the same breath, because those are inextricably linked. Uh, there's no question about it. And I do think we're going to be seeing more recognition of that. Uh, certainly, and I will, I will confess to having a vested interest in this, in that I, I do co-chair with Dr. Patrick Moore, who is one of the co-founders of Greenpeace, something called Case Energy, Clean Safe Energy Coalition, which talks about nuclear energy. And one of the big concerns on nuclear is water usage. And they, they're two different types of reactors. They use different amounts of water. Most of it is returned to the, to, the, uh, to the lakes and the streams and the holding ponds, and you don't lose that much. But there's still, there's a significant issue here. And we're going to have to see more of those kinds of public-private partnerships that marry the two, because as our utilities, there's going to be a 21 percent increase, projected 21 percent increase in electricity demand in this country by 2030. To meet that demand, we're going to have to bring on new energy sources. Our current energy system is just not going to be able to meet it, and that's not even talking about the infrastructure needs of that system, which are enormous as well as the water system. And as each utility starts to face this, one of the questions they're getting more and more is water usage. The concerns being raised are the interrelationship between uh, energy, extraction of energy, how do you use, how do you produce energy, and the water usage that goes along with it. So I haven't seen many examples yet of it, but I, I hear more and more of the question being raised, 
as the utilities go forward to look for the new energy sources that they're going to bring online. And it's like looking at the full carbon footprint. When you talk about a carbon footprint or something, you really look at the beginning and the end. They're starting now more and more, and companies are being required to look at the entire carbon footprint, meaning how do you get your material from one place to another? How is it made? not just the end product or not just your little part of it, but everything that goes into that process, they're going to start to have to look at water as being part of that as well, and looking at the whole scope of, of energy production as it relates to water. I hope that answered your question. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, Madam Governor, uh, impressively covered the answer to this question. So just for the sake of time, I think uh, we may not uh, add anything further than that. So we go to the next okay. uh, person who would like to have distinguished delegate. Uh, I think that uh, I should uh, ask uh, Dr. Mike Maggie, but Dr. Maggie, please kindly uh, introduce yourself for the record. We all know you, please. Yeah, I'm Mike Maggie uh, with HealthyWaters.org, and uh, we focus on uh, getting health professionals more involved in the water issue. And the question I had, Governor, is, um, as you know, we've been very focused on the American diet of late, uh, mainly because of the chronic disease burden that's associated with the diet that we have and uh, with the uh, problem with childhood obesity. <coughs> but a related issue has to do with um, the fact that the American diet is an enormous water consumer, that it takes about 3,000 liters of water in order to support uh, the daily American diet for an average American. So the question I had was whether uh, your uh, policy institute is looking at all at this issue of possible uh, water conservation gains that might come uh, with moving the American diet toward less processed food and less meat and more grain. No, in a word, we're not. We haven't, but it is something we will, <laughs> now that you have brought it up. I have to confess to you, at this point, we have not identified that as being one of the areas of focus, but I will make sure that we do. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, distinguished delegates at the very end would like to ask a question. Please kindly introduce yourself. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Mankwitz. I run the Gaia Institute in New York City, although I was born in the beautiful state of New Jersey. Uh, I'm uh, just, uh, uh, I, I love your idea of source control, and that's uh, really spectacular. The, the problem is the capital, potential capital intensiveness and the time frame of getting that in place is not necessarily an easy way to stabilize uh, political economies where there is trouble and uh, there are uh, essentially volatile elements. I'm wondering if you're looking at any, or you know of people who are looking at any way to look at individual household or community scale water supply that can be coupled with, in the longer term, uh, the uh, better goal of source control in getting a, a watershed that actually supports uh, larger communities? I'm trying to think of how the, the best way to answer that is. Um, in a short answer, yes, we're looking at those sorts of things. But the biggest issue that we have and that I have seen both at EPA and, and subsequently is, is educating the individual. We have, as I think we probably all, the Americans here will remember, that the Exxon Valdez spill was the worst single environmental disaster that we've had in this country. And yet every eight months, as much oil is deposited along the coastline United States from non-point source pollution as was released during that spill. That's from people, you know, not changing, not fixing a leaky oil pan or changing the oil in their car in their driveway and, and letting it run under the pavement because they say, I don't live near a stream. What difference is it going to make to me? So educating the public and doing it on a community commu by community basis to say we live in a watershed. Most people look at you and say, what's a watershed? They have no idea. And you try to tell them everybody lives in a watershed. It's like a drainage area. We're all in a drainage area somewhere. One of the things we did uh, while I was at EPA, and I, I don't know what's happened to it subsequently, is we did a study, and it showed that Americans, at least, are most focused on learning when they're watching the news during the weather, because that's when you've got those neat maps showing, you know, you've got a high here and a low here, and you're going to freeze for the next month, and then you're going to boil, and all that kind of neat stuff. And people are paying attention then. 
So we went to the Meteorological Association and they said, would you do a pilot program where you would educate your meteorologists to say when they're doing the weather and saying there's going to be a big rainstorm, you know, that we're going to have a nor'easter here in New York, New Jersey next week. So it's not a good idea to go out and fertilize your lawn because if you do, it's only going to get washed away. And you, oh, by the way, live in this watershed. Here is where your water is going to go. Here is where it is going to end up. This is why we had dead zones. It's going to be that kind of thing that's going to enable us eventually to get to the communities to educate people so that they understand that this is something that on a community by community basis, it's nature doesn't observe geopolitical boundaries. That's the challenge that we have here. Water companies and utilities tend to be localized and they serve a particular community and, and it's very hard to get people to plan across municipal boundaries and governmental boundaries and yet that's where the, the issues are not relegated to a, a single community. And so it, it's taking, it's going to take a much broader approach as well as being a little more, well I hate the term because it's so overused, outside the box thinking, some more creative <laughs> thinking to try to get people, and it's true everywhere, try to get people to really understand the issue and challenges around water and how everything that they do actually has a cumulative impact. That they in and of themselves, if they fix the leaky water faucet in their bathroom, it may not save them a whole lot of water. But if everybody in their neighborhood did it, you'd be saving hundreds of gallons and that that would make a real difference over time. So people are becoming more aware of it and the people who study the issue I'm not sure I'd say that the public in general is, and that's going to take a lot more education. Any? Yes, sir. <clears throat> this country has producers. an aversion to planning, long-range planning always has. Uh, uh, I'm wondering what are your thoughts about implementation of a national water policy? But, uh, can you also kindly introduce yourself for the record, please? Dry project. I think the possibilities of having a national water policy uh, enacted any time in the near future are slim to none. Um, I say that because if you look at the problems we have now in enforcing the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the pushback that we're getting on, on some of those areas, the idea of trying to take the next step and having a national water policy would just be enormous. And frankly, it's interesting because this is one buzzsaw that I ran into my first two weeks at EPA was dealing with the uh, leftover regulations that had been put through at the end of the Clinton administration, one of which had to do with arsenic in drinking water, reducing it from 90 parts per billion, for 50 parts per billion then down to 10, something I'd done in the state of New Jersey already, and I didn't have a problem with it, but we didn't have naturally occurring arsenic.